It's bizarre. Somehow the wrong scripture got in for my Ketav Al Shachim portion, so I'm going to read it. I know Linda caught it. <laughs> and I'll read it for you. Therefore, Yeshua said this to them Yes, indeed, I tell you that the Son cannot do anything on his own, but only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son does too. Amen. There's no time like the present to fix something that's not right. Amen? Amen. I want you to open your Bibles, or you can refer to the overhead here. I want to read from a portion a few weeks back, Parsha 3, Lechacha, reading from Breshit, or Genesis chapter 12, 14 to 19. Amen. When Avram entered Egypt, the Egyptians did notice that the woman, Sarah, was very beautiful. Pharaoh's princes saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. So the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. He treated Avram well for her sake, giving him sheep, cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female slaves and camels. But Adonai inflicted great plagues on Pharaoh and his household because of Sarah, Avram's wife. Pharaoh called Avram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why didn't you tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say that she is my sister so that I took her to be my own wife? Now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her. Go away. And again, for this morning's portion so Yitzhak settled in Gerar. The men of the place asked him about his wife, and out of fear he said, she is my sister. He thought, if I tell them she's my wife, they might kill me in order to take Rivka. After all, she is a beautiful woman. But one day, after he had lived there a long time, Avimelech, king of Philistim, happened to be looking out of a window when he spotted Yitzhak caressing Rivka, his wife. Avimelech summoned Yitzhak and said, So, she is your wife after all? How come you said she is my sister? And Yitzhak responded, Because I thought I could get killed because of her. Like father, like son. You know, all of us have heard this phrase, haven't we? It's, it's an old cliche. Uh, it dates back, actually, to about the 1300s, at least in the English language and print. And, of course, it just means that children often follow their parents in behavior <clears throat> or in physical or emotional or social characteristics or even in character that we talked about last Shabbat. And there are similar phrases you might have heard. Hey, he's a chipper off the old block. Heard that one, right? Or the apple hasn't fallen too far from the tree. But there's actually a similar phrase, and it's in Ezekiel, or Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 44, like mother, like daughter, that's there. I can't tell you how many times my sons <laughs> said this. They sit there and they held their head and they go, oh my gosh, I just said something you would have said. <laughs> or, I've just done something you would have done. What the heck? <laughs> They had this, I don't know if it's dismay or honor. I think it's more dismay than anything else. But uh, <laughs> this raises an old debate. And the old debate is the old nature versus nurture debate. Nature versus nurture. Are children more shaped by their genetics by what they've inherited genetically from mom and dad, or are they more shaped by the environment that they are in? Of course, psychologists remain extremely divided by this 
discussion. I think scripture actually gives credence to both points of view that we do inherit something from our parents, of course, something that just comes down to us through the genes of our parents, are inheriting a human-like nature with our parents. But also, but also the way parents raise their children can have significant social, emotional, as well as a spiritual impact and implications on their lives. So the question that all of us have to ask on this Shabbat and whenever is what legacy are we leaving our children? What is it that we have imparted to our children? Whether through genetics or through environment, through nature or through nurture. Now you, like me, probably at one time or another, referring to someone else, you might have said this statement. You might have said, yeah, we've got history, right? Have you ever said that? Sure you have. We've got history. Well, this week's parasha begins with these words. Here is the toldot. Here is the history of Yitzhak, Avraham's son. Avraham fathered Yitzhak. Now, most of the time, if you look throughout Scripture, when the word toldot is used in the Torah, it is in relationship to genealogy. It's in relation to genealogy since its primary meaning is descendants of offspring. However, sometimes in scripture, a person's character or their unique traits are listed as their toldot, rather than listing their physical offspring. Avram was a great patriarch. There's no arguing that. Great father of, of our faith. Nonetheless, like all people, Avraham was far from perfect. Far from perfect. And still had much room for improvement when it came to living a holy and a set-apart life trusting God, as it is with us. Amen? Didn't get a big amen on that one. He became, though, because we are to work out our salvation. You know, there's salvation, then there's sanctification. He over time, became more and more sanctified in his relationship with Adonai. But even if we have respect for someone, and this is kind of where I'm getting at today, even if we have the highest regard and respect and value for someone, the witness of this father and son will teach us something. Teach us that we should be cautious about using a person's questionable or poor examples as our excuse to emulate their ways. The only standard we should be measuring ourselves by is the Torah of Adonai and by the witness of Yeshua the Messiah who perfectly kept his father's way, his father's instructions. And as our heavenly father said in Vayikra or Leviticus 19.2, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and tell them, you shall be holy. For I, Hashem, your God, am holy. Like father, like mother. Do you remember back, a few chapters back in Breshid or Genesis 16, verses 1 to 2, and actually in 17, verses 18 and 19, Avraham tried to bring about God's promises by his own works. When it came to the seed that was promised to him, he tried to fulfill these promises through Hagar, who would give birth to Ishmael, instead of through Sarah, who would give birth to the seed of promise, namely Yitzhak, or Isaac. So likewise, in this week's Parashat Toldot, guess what? <laughs> Daughter-in-law Rivka also sought to bring about God's promises by her own works. Instead of trusting in God's provision and the promise that was given to her, Breshit or Genesis 25, 23. It states, Hashem said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your body. The one, the one people will be stronger than the other people and the elder will serve the younger. 
And as we continue to read, we find that the younger was Yitzhak. It was Isaac. And then many years later, in Breshit or Genesis 27, verse 6 to 10, we read, Rivka spoke to Yaakov, her son, saying, Behold, I heard your father speak to Esau of your brothers, saying, Bring me venison and make me savory food that I may eat and bless you before Hashem, before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command you. Go now to the flock and get me from there two good kids of the goats. And I will make them savory food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father that he may eat, so that he may bless you before his death. Just a little tangent here. Have you ever, and to consider maybe for a future drosh, have you ever wondered why Esau needed to go hunting? They were up there in their armpits in flocks and herds. Why would he have to go hunting? Think about that sometime. Anyway, like her in-laws, Rivka takes matters into her own hands and starts to panic about how things will never will ever happen the way they are supposed to in her eyes. And so she rushes to intervene to help Adonai fulfill the prophecy that he gave her. Even Yaakov was a little unsettled by what mom was up to. He didn't think, you know, he was wondering, maybe is this the right thing to do, mom? For reading from 27 verse 12, what if my father touches me? Uh, I will seem to him as a deceiver. And I would bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Now, some reading these passages may take this as a signal that it is all right. It was okay to deceive sometimes by following some of the examples of the patriarchs and the matriarchs that were displayed their moments of weakness. But when it comes to questionable behavior, brothers and sisters, the saying like father or son or like mother, like daughter, should not be a valid excuse for us. We should not find comfort in other bad examples, regardless of how we feel about them. We should say, well, he or she did it, so it must be okay, it worked. Sometimes we don't really, and hear me, sometimes we don't fully appreciate the consequences that our parents have suffered because of their choices and by following in their footsteps because we have fallen short as well. You know, in the examples given thus far, we can see that in each instance, the patriarchs and the matriarchs had to suffer some very uncomfortable accountability and consequences. And sometimes we realize the mistake only when it is too late. But they are still valuable examples in the Torah that we should learn from. For if we learn the lesson, we don't always have to go down our parents or anybody else we respect the same road that they did We not only can learn from their good examples, but we can also learn from their mistakes. Their mistakes. The same holding true for the patriarchs and the matriarchs of our faith. Rabbi Shaul, Apostle Paul in his first letter to Corinth, reading from chapter 10, verse 11, he teaches us the following. These things happened to them as prefigurative historical events, and they were written down as a warning to us who are living in the Acharit Hayamim, the end of days. A warning to us. And thus, instead of using the examples of our biblical patriarchs and matriarchs as an excuse to engage in the same dysfunctional behavior, we are taught to learn from said behavior and avoid the same consequences. For example, let me use some examples. Let's say uh, 
And there's actually some examples of that here. Not here, but here. Anyway. Let's say mom and dad are big partiers. Like to drink a little bunch. Like to smoke a little weed or whatever. The big partiers. Don't allow that to be a standard for you just because mom and dad does it. Yeah, more often than not, if you have alcoholic parents, you will have alcoholic kids because they follow the example. If either your father or mother were violent or abusive, witnessing the consequences, don't drink as they had from the wine of violence, the scripture calls it, because it's very tasty. Our culture is enamored with violence now. Enamored with violence. It entertains us. We love it. What if your parents wrongly divorced each other? One or the other divorced their spouse. Don't let that become an acceptable standard for you. Just because they did, it didn't mean it was right. What if your mother or father buried themselves in debt? They live off credit cards. Don't follow their example of mismanaging money just because they did it. Or if your father or mother put the world and its things before serving God, don't let that become an excuse for you to do likewise. Just because they had some time in the world doesn't mean that you have to have some time in the world. Many in these end of days will recognize that they've had poor examples to follow and will recognize that those examples didn't follow after the way of truth. And then instead of inheriting a birthright and eternal life, they instead inherited lies and hypocrisy and futile things. Yermiyahu, the prophet Jeremiah, says in chapter 16, verse 19, Hashem, my strength, my fortress, my refuge in time of trouble, the nations will come to you from the ends of the earth, saying our ancestors inherited nothing but lies, futile idols, completely useless. The Torah, brothers and sisters, is teaching us how to reverse generational curses. The Torah is screaming at all of us to reverse generational curses and change the direction of our families and our futures. Again, overall, the patriarchs and matriarchs of Israel most certainly presented us today excellent examples for us to follow. And we're given the ability to choose, to choose to follow those holy and just and good examples that they presented us. If our parents display a good, godly example, hallelujah, as compared to the measuring stick of the Holy Scriptures, that is an example you can be confident with and you can walk with and follow. If you've got godly parents. But one thing is for sure, You can't blame your father or parents for them personally making poor choices in life. Because they did. They did. Every parent here, I'm sure in the still and the quietness of their own prayer time or lives, reflect upon those times in their life they made poor choices. And every one of you wish you could go in Mr. Whoopi's Wayback Machine which is in my time, and go change that. But we can't. We can't redeem the past. We can only learn from it and move forward into the future. And that is where some of the psychology out there will lead you astray. You're not only a product of how your parents nurtured or raised you, you're also a product of your environment. But we cannot use that as an excuse for our conduct. For each person is going to be held individually responsible for their own actions and choices. You can't blame it on mom and dad. 
You can't say they made me this way. I didn't have a choice. You can't do that. You were responsible at age 13 and above as the bar bought me. So you are now accountable to your own decisions and your own choices. Each person is responsible for their own rebellion, their own sin. As it says in Devarim or Deuteronomy 24, 16, the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every person shall be put to death for his or her own sin. It's on you, not on them. No parent is divine. No mom and dad walk the perfect road. And again, in Ezekiel 18, verses 18 to 22, we read, Yet his father, because he oppressed so cruelly, committed robbery against his brother and never did anything good among his people. He will die for his sins. And you ask, why doesn't the son bear his father's guilt? When the son has done what is lawful and right, he kept all my laws and obeyed them, he will certainly live. The person who sins is the one that will die. A son is not to bear his father's guilt with him, nor is the father to bear his son's guilt with him. But the righteousness of the righteous will be his own, and the wickedness of the wicked will be his own. However, if the wicked person repents of all the sins he committed, keeps my laws, and does what is lawful and right, then he will certainly live. He will not die. None of the transgressions he has committed will be remembered against him for the righteousness that he has done. He will live. In other words, according to the scriptures, while it certainly is effective when parents disciple their children in righteousness, on the other hand, it is not a foregone conclusion that a son or daughter that is being raised by a parent or by parents displaying a poor example will always be the result of their upbringing and environment. And this is especially true when such a child sees the detrimental consequences their parents or their parents' parents suffered and chose instead to follow a righteous Messiah-like way. And it is especially true when a son or daughter chooses to receive the Basarot to vote, the message of the good news, and is therefore indwelled with the righteous power of the Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit, and has thus established the ultimate role model in their life, which is Yeshua. Brothers and sisters, Yeshua is the ultimate example. He is the ultimate good example of like father, like son, which leads to life. In Yochanan or John 5, 19, again, from where I read, for whatever the father does, these the son also does likewise. And this is the example, Yeshua, that we are to follow. But when we follow the bad examples, we give up our birthright, just as Esau gave up his. Ephraim or Hebrews 12, 14 to 16 says, keep pursuing shalom with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses out on God's grace, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and thus contaminates many, and that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau, who in exchange for a single meal gave up his rights as the firstborn. And it didn't matter as much as Esau whined and cried to his daddy about what had happened, It's too late. It's too late. The decisions he made in life were his own, and he couldn't blame anybody but himself. He couldn't blame it on mom or dad. Again, in Ephraim chapter 12, verses 14 to 16, we are warned not to be defiled by a root of bitterness by which many are contaminated. You know, often we think we have a right to act inappropriately. I have a right to be inappropriate when someone angers us or causes us to become bitter and we blame our poor behavior on someone else when really we just need to grow up and mature and take responsibility for our own actions. Something that is 
sadly lacking today because that's where we're at today. You wonder why the world is the way it is today? I got a wake-up call for you. Here, I, I, I haven't figured it out. I used to say that when I was in high school. Dude, I got it all figured out. Well, this I got figured out. I got figured out. You know what it is? Nobody's accountable. There's no consequences for your actions anymore. Everybody goes, why is this happening? Because there's no accountability. There's no consequences for your choices anymore. You get pregnant, you live off the government. You marry the government. You want something, you steal it. Or you lie. And that's where we're at today. And nobody's holding anybody accountable for their actions. That's because we have become, as a culture, contaminated. Nobody is taking any more responsibility for their own actions. You know, in Yochanan or John chapter 8, verses 38 to 44, Yeshua teaches us further about the concepts of like father, like son. I'll read it for you. He says, I say what my father has shown me. You do what your father has told you. And they answered him, our father is Abraham. And Yeshua replied, well, if you are children of Abraham, then do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are out to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did nothing like that. You're doing the things your father does. My father. We're not illegitimate children. They said to him, we have only one father, God. And Yeshua replied to them, well, if God were your father, you would love me because I came out from God and now I have arrived here. I did not come on my own. He sent me. Why don't you understand what I'm saying? Because you can't bear to listen to my message. That's why you belong to your father, Hasatan. And you want to carry out your father's desires. From the start, he was a murderer. And he has never stood by the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he is speaking in character because he is a liar. Indeed, he is the inventor of the lie. How many people are living a lie these days? Living a lie. You know, on a much deeper level, Yeshua teaches us about who our true father figures have been in our life and how we can determine who it is has really been rearing us all these years. Who's really been our father influence all these years? You know, as I shared another saying goes, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, if you read in Matthew, or Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 to 20, Yeshua says, you will recognize them by their fruit. Can people pick grapes from thorn bushes? Figs from thistles. Likewise, every healthy tree produces good fruit, but a poor tree produces bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, or a poor tree good fruit. Any tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you will recognize them by their... Apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But if we make it our practice to follow in the example of people who give us an excuse to lower God's standards to anything or anyone, that doesn't reflect the high bar set by the word of God. We can insist all we want, that we have God, that we love God, and are children of God. But in reality, Yeshua says that we will be identified as being spiritually from the loins of Hasatan. For who we act like tells us who our father really is. Really is. You know, again, Yochanan Aleph, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 to 7, I read the following. This is how we know that we know him. 
if we keep his mitzvot. How do you dance around that? How do you possibly dance around that? How can you make an excuse for doing anything apart from the Torah at that point? How can you say it's nailed to a tree? How can you say that? When right there it says, how, do we, how we know that we know him and love him is that we keep his mitzvot. One who says, I know him and doesn't keep his mitzvot is a liar. A liar. I want that to sink in. I really do. Because I take hard positions on certain things because in the world that we're living in today, there is no accountability to that truth. They're a liar. And the truth isn't in them. No matter how holy and righteous and intelligent and theological they are, the truth is not there. It's not in them. But whoever keeps his word, God's love has most assuredly been perfected in him. This is how we know that we are in him. He who says he remains in him ought himself also to walk just like he walked. Brothers and sisters, I write no new mitzvah to you. (laughs) There's nothing new here. Do you realize that? That is... That is such a misconception when you say New Testament. There's nothing new in the New Testament. Hear that. There is nothing new in the New Testament. It is an affirmation of the original Testament. I write no new mitzvah to you. But an old mitzvah which you had from the beginning. The old mitzvah is the word which you heard from the beginning. Now, if you have issue with that, you're going to have to take it up with the scripture. I'm just going to preach it. And I am going to conclude. Stop it. You know, when we had people around the Thanksgiving table, the Lord had put this scripture on my heart. It's kind of an odd scripture for Thanksgiving, but nonetheless, it just kept resonating in my spirit. Proverbs 14, and actually Proverbs 16 too, I believe. Same scripture. It's repeated twice in Proverbs. Verbatim. Verbatim. There can be a way which seems right to a person, but at its end are the ways of death. And a lot of ways out there seem right. They look good, smell good, look prosperous and abundant and blessed. They must be good. But actually, at its end, are the ways of death. The way of Yeshua, brothers and sisters, the faithful son who was truly like his father, leads to life, leads to life. It is essential that we keep our eyes on him, that we keep our eyes on him. If we keep our eyes on any other, then when they fall, which they likely will, we will likely fall with them. And we see it so much in the pulpit today. So much. It's just a matter of time when those are standing in their various pulpits. And sooner or later, when they realize that they're not teaching the truth, that the end for them and for their congregations will be an end. They will fall, and those who have followed them will fall with them. Regardless of how someone may appear to be, humankind will ultimately fail you. Ultimately, they will fail you. And that's, sometimes, that's of course, our opportunity for grace. Our opportunity for grace.
because all have fallen short. But we could trust our Heavenly Father. That's what I want to affirm you with today. You could trust your Heavenly Father and His Son, Messiah Yeshua, because they are always constant, always righteous, always faithful. Reading from Tehillim 146, verses 3 to 6, we're told, don't put your trust in princes. Translated in modern vernacular, don't put your trust in politicians. They are all corrupt. Even your favorites, and I have mine as well. But I also recognize the fact that they are failed and flawed. Don't put your trust in princes or in mortals who cannot help. When they breathe their last, they turn to dust. And on that very day, all their plans are gone. Happy are those who help is Yaakov's God, whose hope is in Hashem, his God. He made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, and he keeps faith forever. Brothers and sisters, we can't allow others to become an excuse for our own failing or stumbling. We've got to take responsibility for our own actions. There's a lot of psychologists making a lot of money today. telling people that it was their parents or their environment. No, what psychologists need to be telling people is it's about time that you grow up and take responsibility for your actions. That's what they need to be telling them, the hard word, the true word. Amen? And while we should follow the good examples of our parents and elders and should learn from them instead of putting all our hope and trust in humankind, we should remember that it is Yeshua the Messiah who will never fail us because if we see and follow him, then we are following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you remember this and practice this, your faith will always be strong And you'll always be on a secure footing. Among the weaknesses and failings of humankind, Adonai is a father figure that we can always look up to with certainty. Amen? We have such a faithful Abba who deeply cares and loves us so very much, even to the point of correcting us when needed, because that's what a good father does. So on that note, reading from Devereen 31.8, we are encouraged with the following words. And I want to leave you with encouragement. But Hashem, it is he who will go ahead of you. And he will be with you. And he will neither fail you nor abandon you. So don't be afraid or downhearted. And as it says at the end of Scripture, the very final words of your Bibles, the grace of the Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, be with us all. Amen. Please rise. And let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are mindful of the fact that life begins with an earthly father. But then it doesn't end there. It just begins a process of nurturing and growth. And some of those examples of nurturing and growth are good and godly, and some have been tragic. And some have been ambivalent. Examples they are for good and for not so good. But lessons can be learned both ways. God help us to learn those lessons and to remember that Yeshua is who we should keep our eyes upon because he is a good son. And like the father, so was the son and is the son and will be the son for eternity. 
Help us, Father, to measure our earthly influences upon that standard and to glean from our earthly examples lessons and wisdom and both the good and the not so good. And Father, to take into our families and our futures the lessons learned so that we might be righteous examples and be a blessing. Be a blessing to our families, to our neighbors, and to this world as witnesses of righteous, holy, set-apart living as you desire for us to present. We make no excuses, Father. We are accountable for our choices. Help us, Holy Spirit, to make them correctly by learning from the patriarchs and matriarchs of our faith. B'Shem Yeshua Adonai, the congregation says.